That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Menu, the fourth film directed by Mark Millard, which premiered at the 2022 Toronto International Film Festival and is being released just in time for your Thanksgiving palettes uh, November 18th, 2022. The director? Mark Millard, who's probably best known for his work in television and things like Succession, Game of Thrones, um, a couple other things I actually can't think about. Uh, in film, uh, his last feature was an on a Ferris film called What's Your Number, which I remember not liking. Uh, and his debut was technically Ali G into House. Okay. If you remember that. Well, I thought this movie was very good. I did as well. I'm very curious about what the original uh, title might have been because I don't know that this uh, properly evokes the film, but. Uh, the story is very basic, but I think what really sends it over the edge is, uh, or differentiates it from like your average, is the performance from Ray Fiennes. I think Ray Fiennes and I think Anya Taylor-Joy. And Taylor Anya Taylor-Joy. I actually, I think it's a pretty decent ensemble. It feels like uh, uh, kind of an Agatha Christie style narrative of uh, Well, people. it's always fun to see Judith Light mm -hmm. and the woman playing the critic. I think Janet McTeary is always yeah. welcome as well. Okay, the basic story is Ray Fiennes plays a chef who, um, he's the executive chef of the, a restaurant on this island called Hawthorne Island, mm -hmm. and it's super exclusive. Uh, it appears that only like 12 people a night maybe are allowed to attend uh, at $1250, $1,250 a head, tip is included, which I thought was quite reasonable, but anyway. Yeah, that's not that bad really, but... Um, and... So, spoiler review, obviously, we find out that he and his staff are basically at their wit's end. They no longer find joy in the art of, like, like in the culinary arts. Because he in particular, the, the weakest part of the story to me is we don't really understand why his staff are involved in this plan. But he has reached a point in his career where he's sort of forced to cater to this elite clientele. But the joy of cooking is lost. These people only care about the experience, not the actual food. Yes, he's backed himself into the upper echelons to a, a corner where he's forced to try to please people that can never be pleased. So he decides that on this night, on this day, he has created a menu, like a prefix six course meal, which sounds like that's what he normally does, that will culminate with all of the guests being killed along with all of the staff. Mm -hmm. So it's like a murder-suicide Jonestown situation. It's like Jonestown on the Food Network. But where things sort of uh, differ is that Anya Taylor-Joy's character, she's brought there by a character named Tyler, played by... Nicholas Holt. Mm -hmm. Who had originally had a, a different date, like his girlfriend, but they bro bro broke up, so he brought her. And we find out not only is she a prostitute, but that Tyler has been communicating with the chef for like the past eight months and was privy to the plan, which is that everyone was going to die. So he hired this poor lady knowing that she would be killed. Fortunately, the chef takes a liking to Anya Taylor's character because he recognizes that she's a service worker just like he is. Mm -hmm. But he still says she has to die. However... She has to pick what side she wants to die with, though. The, 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 the givers or the takers. But an, another part of the plot that we can get into that didn't quite make sense to me is he allows her to leave the restaurant to go to his quarters to get something. And while she's there, she sees some of his personal effects. The chefs. One of which is a news article of Rafe Fiennes uh, as the chef, as a young man, like cooking at a burger joint. And he has this big smile on his face. Whereas every other picture, he's not smiling. So, right at the time, like at the 11th hour, when they're all about to be killed, Anya's character stands up and says, wait a minute, I wanna take, I wanna send my food back. I didn't like it. I haven't enjoyed anything you prepared tonight. Part of the experience is that I enjoy it and you didn't provide me that. So not only that, but I'm also hungry. Mm -hmm. And he says, well, what can I make you? And she asked for a cheeseburger. And we see Rafe like light up, like, oh, I can make you the best cheeseburger you've ever had. And he does. And she says, which I thought was a pretty slick 
plot point, or, you know, a part of the story is she goes, can I take this to go? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Meaning, like, can I get the fuck up out of here? Mm -hmm. And he grabs this lady a to-go box. But only at the point where she pays as well. And then she pays her little $9.95. Mm -hmm. I, I really thought, I thought that was a good part of the movie. And then she leaves, mm -hmm. gets on a boat to get off the island. And then we see that the final scene for everyone else in the restaurant is that he's made all of the uh, guests into like human s'mores bars mm -hmm. and he lights that bitch on fire uh -huh. the end um, uh, while she looks on uh, at a distance from the boat she absconded on eating the remains of her cheeseburger that's right so beyond just the really strong lead performances i felt i really appreciated that the film ended in sort of a i mean it's, i mean it's sad it's sad. It's it's. I mean, technically, you could classify this, this as a horror comedy, but to me, this it 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 was kind of depressing as a social satire. I've talked about this before, but it really resonated with me as someone who also used to be a service worker, um, mm -hmm. specifically doing hair. Like that, all the joy of it gets sucked out. So then it's like the more sort of elite one becomes, and the more I can charge, and the the better clientele, it actually becomes like. Like a less desirable environment. Yes. And then uh, paired that if you're uh, like working in some creative capacity serving people and when you become beholden to that uh, as your livelihood and how that can ruin you as an artist. So going through my notes, you know, we're not rich. So $1,250 is a lot of money to me. That would but, be a very special treat. But Right. But I kind of thought that because the experience of these people is they get on a ferry, they take the boat, they get on the island in daylight hours, and the head person played by... Hong Chao. Hong, Hong Chao. Mm -hmm. Hong Chao is like the main assistant to the chef. She gives a tour of the grounds because all of the food that the customers are eating are either like harvested from the island, sourced from the ocean, or they have a farm where the other meat comes from. So like they get a tour and everything's explained to them and then this is a very elaborate experience with the six course meal. I kind of thought 1250 seemed cheap because it's also paired with wine. And then Ray Fine's character does say like the tip is included. So I thought, yeah, that seemed really reasonable. <laughs> Not that I'm running around paying twelve fifty for dinner. Well, it, it's a, it's a weird balance because you know they explain how they age the the cows for one hundred fifty well. whatever days. And it, it, it seems very much like you have a very short limited of time to eat this meat at a certain taste level before it goes bad. And also, if they're only allowing twelve people, I'm assuming per night, that's not a lot of money. Like you know, thirteen, fourteen thousand dollars a night for this very elaborate. So that seemed odd, but... But maybe the overhead's low because the only one that doesn't live on the island is the chef. Uh, he does live on the island. He just doesn't live in the dormitory with Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah, that's right. But um, if there's a situation like this out there, I would go. If someone wants to invite... I mean, just don't kill us. Sure. But, but I would, you know... <laughs> um, so the opening is really awkward because when... Anya and her date, uh, what's his name again? Tyler, played by Nicholas Holt. Nicholas. When they get to, uh, oh gosh, what's the assistant's name? Elsa. <laughs> Elsa. Hong Chao. Hong Chao's character. She's running through the invitation list. And she goes, oh, you must be Ms. Blah, blah, blah. And Anya's like, no. I thought that was so good. Because mm -hmm. it also, you know, it's very obvious what's going to happen in the movie. But I think... You know, it it just establishes very early on that she's different, and then so my intention is really on her, and she delivers. Yes, yes, as she usually does. Uh, uh, everybody is has been pre-selected as a sort of ingredient, which reminded me of Nine Perfect Strangers, but this does kind of everything I wanted to it to do that Nine oh, Perfect Strangers does not. We should talk about the guests. So Tyler and Tyler is he's kind of like a soulless sycophant. Exactly. But, and there's a really good scene where he's kind of brought to his knees. We should talk about that, but it's important to know that Tyler's character... Did I mention he had been corresponding with the show? So that's his role. That's a third act reveal, but yeah. Then we get John Leguizamo, who's playing like a... Like, a notable like, actor. Like a notable actor who maybe is a little washed up, maybe, mm -hmm. with his assistant. Then we get Judith Light and her husband, who are just rich people who have experienced this restaurant 11 times... And we find out that they can't name anything they've eaten there, mm -hmm. which really enrages the chef. Yes, because, and I think that's what finally allows you to lose whatever little 
kind of empathy you have for the Judith Light character, whose husband is played by Reed Burney. Uh, is he the guy from Gianni Versace? Is she the one who plays his husband? Is he the one who plays her husband? In that, that gets murdered? No. Oh, okay. You might know him. He's in a ton of stuff. I recognize him. The 40-year-old uh, version. Oh, he plays He's, the producer. Mm -hmm. Yes. I thought they were great. But yeah, they play like... House of Cards as well. Yes. Then we have three additions. Then we find out that there is a benefactor to the restaurant. Mm -hmm. There's a really funny line where that person... he So three of... The person who's funding the restaurant, like a, like a, a what do you call it, uh, an angel investor, he has three sort of like uh, minions who are eating that night and they're being total douchebags because mm -hmm. they think they're a big deal too. That angel investor, Ray Fiennes has like kidnapped him and kills him. In front of them all, yeah. Yeah. Out, he, outside of the restaurant, he... He does this whole fallen angel thing where he puts wings on him yeah. and drowns him. But I thought there was a funny moment right before they... Right, right before Rafe kills that guy, his little three minions are like, he kept you open during COVID. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Uh, well, they the tipping point is during the second course, which is supposed to be bread, which Ray finds. Uh, uh, she gives the Chef history. Slowick, the history of bread, which is a poor people's food, and he's like, "So you're not gonna get any bread. You're just gonna get the accoutrement to the bread. It's like the olive oil and the blah blah blah." And th those three get so upset, and there's a really good scene with Hong Chao where yes. she's. They like, come on, give us some bread. And she says no. And they like, try to push up on her, like we don't want to pull, like, like we don't want to throw our weight around. But you're gonna do what we ask. And she's like, absolutely not. And she says something to one of them, like to you're gonna get less than Arturo you want. Castro. No, she she goes, you're gonna get less than you want, but more than you deserve. Mm -hmm. I thought that was creepy. Uh, yes, but at the point, you know, it felt very, I think the moment that feels very good is they're like, did you just say no? And if you've ever worked for some asshole that uh, gives you a line like that, run away screaming because... Uh, but going back to the, he kept us up, he kept you open during COVID, then Rafe is like, I can't stand him. He made me do all these things. And like, he made me like, do substitutions and then Rafe is screaming, there are no substitutions. I thought that was really funny. Um, they something else that kind of didn't work for me is immediately when we enter the dining room we see that there's this old woman sitting off in the corner by herself drinking lambrusco which obviously does not fit with the tone of this and high end your, restaurant your ears are supposed to perk up at that I too, know but, but she's just like this and then we find out it's Rafe's like the chef's mother and that he sort of despises her so but the, it's interesting because the, the there's a class hierarchy in, um, built it connoted by food and I'd, I'd like the Janet, Mc, you know, watching it in a film full, a uh, room full of film critics, it's like there are people there that sound just like she does. Oh, I didn't mention about. she's the final guest. So it's Janet McTierney. Janet McTier. McTier with, she's like a notable food critic. And the reason she's been brought there is because she's kind of awful because some of her reviews have caused restaurants to close down. And then her assistant, who's like a total ass kisser, which I thought was very well done. Uh, I think he works for the magazine she's covering this oh, article right, for right. because he picks up the bill. But Then the, one of the courses is like the chef's signature dish, which is like chicken tacos. But he's done something different where all of the tortillas have been laser printed with something relevant to each um, guest. And there's a nice withering line about having to stay relevant. <laughs> And I thought that was really good because there's like images of like, you know, Judith Light's husband is like with some other woman and, that, that, and like the three douchebag guys, like their um, like financial records, from documenting the, money is being from the Cayman yeah, Islands. funneled to like the Cayman Islands. Uh, that is another thing. I, I, I think that sometimes the, the script by Seth Reese and Will Tracy, uh, and I believe Mr. Reese is also a succession scribe, but uh, there's a connection between Reed Bernie's also utilize the skills of Anya Taylor Joy, and I, I feel like that feels a little overboard. We don't need that. That's kind of just overly coincidental, especially since she's supposed to be the jarring element that makes that throws this whole dinner out of whack. Um, and also, uh, you'll probably want to speak about it more about how we really don't get to know the staff that much, and I think that plays. Yeah, I want to end with that. Okay. Um, something else that's done a lot, like between every course, is the chef claps really loudly, mm -hmm. which was very jarring. Yes. But it is used at the end by Anya's character. Okay, so the first time something really crazy happens is that one of the like sous chefs named Jeremy, he's brought to the front. And we know it's going to be a problem because they lay down this tarp with like herbs around it. Mm -hmm. So it's like there's going to be a mess made. And sure enough, 
we're told that Jeremy has been like, his dream has been to work for the chef and be like him. But the chef is saying he'll never be great like me. So why even continue? And then we see Jeremy crying and the chef being like, don't you agree? Yes. And his dish, like that course is called the mess. And then all of a sudden we see Jeremy blow his brains out mm -hmm. and that's when everyone's like well before that judith light's husband gets his finger cut off but um yeah things escalate like it's interesting because there's an, uh, an an uncomfortable tension immediately because we know something's not right but then when it escalates it's like there's a there's a point made by Rafe's character saying like you know this entire time you all could have just like banded together no, and overtaken us but you didn't nobody's trying hard enough to leave which reminded me of Triangle of Sadness mm -hmm. when um, Abigail the toilet cleaner on the island like kind of becomes like the leader of all these rich passengers and they never really um, they're just sitting around waiting to be taken care of and they will um, uh, they will. Uh, respond to any conditions they need to to get through it believing that they will be rescued another very interesting scene is the chef Rafe's character he takes everyone outside and explains that one of his sous chefs a woman was subjected to his sexual harassment like he kept she explains that he tried to have sex with her he she wouldn't so then he kind of like punished her by not really interacting with her for like nine months or something so he says that he wants to pay for his uh, misgivings and lets her stab him in the penis with a pair of scissors, which I thought was very interesting. It's like he wants to atone for mm -hmm. it. Like he can't do this to all these assholes unless he sort of atones for what he's done. Yes, and the, how power mutates you. Well. Then, like you mentioned, Tyler is a sycophant, so the, the chef is like, oh, so you know all about cooking. Why don't you come up here and prepare a course? So then, of course, Tyler is scared as hell, and he puts on his, like, they put a coat on him, and they're like, what ingredients do you want? And he's like, oh, give me some leeks. And, and some, some shallots, I some think. Some shallots yeah. and some lamb. But he's all panicked and stressed out. And, and he starts, like, dicing them, and the chef is like, oh... There's lots of very good lines. Like that's a yeah. dicing technique we don't know about. And he prepares his food and it's terrible. Something else that's done is, I don't remember if I mentioned this, but with every course on the screen, there's text explaining what mm -hmm. the course was. And like for Tyler's lamb, Tyler's. which is terrible, they call it like Tyler's bullshit. Yeah. And then in the end, when they're all basically human s'mores, it describes like the dessert is like graham crackers, chocolate marshmallows, and like these human beings, like charred flesh. <laughs> I thought that was funny. Um, so you already mentioned this, but oh, no, no. He, I thought another really good line is John Leguizamo's assistant is trying to quit and he won't let her. And then we find out she's been stealing from him. So she's not a good mm -hmm. person. But she's trying to appeal to the chef, like, I don't belong here either. I'm not a rich person. And he goes, where did you go to school? And she says, Brown. And he goes, did you pay student loans? No. And he goes, you're going to have to die. You're dying. Well, also the whole reason <laughs> Leguizamo is there uh, is because Ray Fiennes happened to see a movie, like one Sunday he had off, which is very rare. And it was apparently this terrible piece of... One of, of John Leguizamo's movies. Excrement. <laughs> He's like, yeah, you deserve to die for that. But so I'm going to give this movie a very good score. But the one thing that really like, like I wish this would have done is we don't know anything about the staff and why they're willing to go through with this Jonestown shit. We do see. And so I would have been OK with that, like what? that they're blindly following the chef, except we see two of the staff members crying. Sure, but what they're, they're, it's explained they live together like family. It's heavily regimented, right? The, almost militaristic. So I, I think that's all the kind of superficial details we're allowed to glean about them. But I think you really, we really need a little more about Hong Chao's Elsa. It works well enough, but I wanted more of the staff mm -hmm. because it's obvious that the patrons are vile. So it's like, great, they can die. But the staff, I, I, I just... Yeah, how I was he, just curious. How did he convince the yeah. rest of them that there's absolutely no hope? Maybe there'll be a prequel. Perhaps. Uh, I like the score by Colin Stetson, who did the score for Hereditary. Uh, it was also shot by Peter Deming, who uh, lends one of the most, one of the best uh, films ever made, really, which was Mulholland Drive. But uh, I, I like everything about it. It's yeah. just it, it left me wanting a little more, which is not a 
a bad thing per se. No. What would you give this film? Uh, I would give it three and a half. I would give it three and a half as well. Anything else? Mm -mm. Hit the thanks button. Listen to our podcast. Bye.